Snap Studios. A young correctional officer. He said it was the most dangerous prison in California. Forced to make a choice. Fulfill his oath or back his fellow officers. Recognize the badge of my office. I'm Suki Lewis from KQED Podcasts comes on our watch season two, New Folsom. A story about who gets hurt when the system that promises to keep us safe is bent on protecting itself. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Step Judgment is brought to you by Progressive, where customers who save by switching their home and car save nearly $800 on average. Quote at Progressive.com. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates, national average 12-month savings of $793 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Okay, so this is what I remember. And someone's going to have to help me fill in the blanks. It's Michigan, a TV show. I do not recall the name. It came on before the local news. Maybe part of the local news? I can't recollect. But what I do know is that I sit there in keen anticipation next to my little brother behind our TV trays. Both of us transfixed. And this cheesy announcer guy, cornball, polyester suit, smiling, in some kind of studio, he'd look around, pick a screaming lady from the crowd. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God. Everybody's excited. He escorts her into a glass booth. Okay, the 60 second timer's about to start. Are you ready, Jan? I'm ready, Tom. And then cash money flies up in the booth. The swirl of green crazy and people are screaming. The lady's scrabbling, reaching, grasping. My brother and I shouting at the screen. No! No! They're doing it all wrong. The timer runs out and the man escorts her. Sheepish, clutching a hold of just a paltry few dollar bills. No! No! There was so much cash. Better luck next time, Jan. The man, he'd say. What is wrong with these people? My brother and I asked this to each other over and over again. What is wrong with them? One day, one day, we're going to show them how it's done. And I'm so happy to say that that day... It has finally arrived. Snap Judgment proudly presents Money Truck. Amazing stories of the big score. My name is from Washington. Always remember and never forget. Use your jacket to catch up all the cash when you're listening to Snap Judgment. Now, Snappers, today we bring you something a little bit different. Six people, each in a different time and place, but they all find themselves in the same predicament, asking the very same question. Super Snapper Shannon Kaysen leads us through a story that these good people never saw coming. Put it like this. If the sky start dropping money out, the whole world will go crazy. July 2019, Tuesday, Atlanta, Georgia, Interstate 285 westbound. The veteran. My name is Philip Dean. I'm 25 years old. Being down in Atlanta, I didn't really have an income. And it was kind of that gap between the GI Bill for college and kind of my active duty paycheck. So I decided to drive for Uber. So um, that day, got on the road, I was driving for four or five hours. I came over this hill, and then I saw about 40 or 45 cars pulled over on the side of the road and people out of their cars. 
is there cops? Is there an ambulance? Is something on fire? What's going on? I need to pull over. I need to help. I got out, walked around, and kind of surveyed what was going on. And then I kind of looked at people taking steps around and picking up things off the ground. I'm like, they're picking up money. Didn't believe there was money on the ground until I saw a lot of money on the ground. It was a pile of money on the ground. It was a pile of leaves. I looked at a couple people and kind of was like, what just happened? August 2003, also a Tuesday, Interstate 80 eastbound in the middle of nowhere, Iowa, the lucky guy. I am that one. I've walked into gas stations and found $400 on the ground. I've been in casinos and found $500 and $1,000 chips. Yeah, I was driving down the highway and out of pretty much nowhere, it started raining cash. Kind of started like a snowstorm with one or two at a time. Next thing you know, it's just hitting you and like dumping on you. I can't see because the windshield of the car was covered. The freeway came to a complete and abrupt stop. There was no way to tell where it came from. We were miles from an exit, just farm fields on both sides. No buildings, no towns, nothing. Money blowing in the breeze and falling from the sky and getting stuck on people's tires and stuck under people's windshield wipers, stuck in the little crevices of their bodywork on their cars. Like, I've been sitting there observing this, trying to process, okay, how did this happen? December 2018, a Thursday, East Rutherford, New Jersey, Route 3, westbound, the bystander. I was commuting, so I am I am stopped high up in a New Jersey transit bus with, you know, the cushion seats and the big windows. And suddenly, everybody on the bus started to kind of look to the left-hand side of our bus and started yelling. Wow. Wow. I thought immediately, oh my, there's some terrible accident. There's a Brinks truck over there, like a... Then I looked over, and I, what I saw was... The Brinks truck, the money fell out. A Brinks truck stopped, and a gentleman in a uniform, an African-American gentleman, who is both kind of crying and laughing at the same time, and there are cars whirring by. He's collecting things off the highway. Look at this. Look at homeboy right here. Stack of money in his hand. And... Uh, a lot of people were yelling things like, "Ooh, he's going to lose his job. October 1999, another Thursday, a farm near Brownsville, Oregon, the lady with the horse pasture. I was grooming at the time. The horses alerted me to it because of the crash. I mean, they, they hear something, they see something, they smell something and their whole posture changes. I came out here and the guard, I guess you'd call him, only one was outside. He had this big rifle slung over his back with a, a strap, you know, and he was very military. Yes, ma'am, no, ma'am. And he didn't want me out here. And I had a bucket and I was trying to pick up broken glass. Well, this is a horse pasture. And we don't want glass in our horse pasture. We don't want the horses eating it. We don't want the horses stepping on it. I was not trying to get any money. I didn't have any money in my bucket. There were no dollar bills. I don't think they were heavy enough to fly out. But the sacks of, <clears throat> of coins did fly out. And they broke. Nickels and dimes and pennies, you know, and stuff like that. I was upset. You don't have a money truck crash in your field very often. May 1999, a Monday, I-95 southbound, outside New York City. I never thought it would be a dream job, but it ended up being a dream job. Who would ever think that you go work in an armored car and carry millions of dollars around and have a gun? <laughs> the armored car guy. I'm the guy. My name is Troy Stokes. I was working for an armored car service, and I was driving money. Yeah, it was the Port Authority money. It was the Turnpike, the Parkway money. It was all A money. The traffic was flowing excellent that day. It was no accidents. Everybody was just moving. As we get on the Turnpike at 13A, we driving. 
a lady in a white Volvo came on the side of me, and I'm seeing in the in the mirror, I seen a car with high beams, like keep hitting the high beams like a police. And was blowing a horn at me, and she literally cut me off. So I got out the truck, and I'm like, what's your problem? What are you doing? And she said, I was trying to tell you, your back of your door opened up and the bag fell out. And the car ran over the bag. And money's everywhere. January 1997. A Wednesday. Miami, Florida. Interstate 395. The cop. So I'm Delrish Moss, formerly with the Ferguson Police Department as police chief and before that, I was a major with the city of Miami Police Department. I was in my office when we gotten word that a Brinks truck uh, had somehow turned over uh, and that money was spilling down off the expressway. This had happened right in the center of Overtown. Overtown for Miami is probably the most economically challenged neighborhood that there is. It's an impoverished neighborhood and suddenly money is raining down from heaven. When I first got the call, I thought, nah, this can't be happening. but it happens all the time. What would you do if you saw money spilling from an armored truck? All over the world. In Hong Kong, there's been a mad scramble for cash. Hundreds and hundreds of accidents. Take a look at this bag of cash. Top heavy trucks. Brinks truck apparently lost some cash. Doors bursting open. It seems like a dream come true. Thousands of dollars in cash. Cash flying through the sky. In each of these events, in each of these places, each person has stepped into a whole new world of possibilities. In New Jersey, the bystander watches in shock. How does this happen? Others on the bus pull out their cell phones and start taking video. <laughs> it was like I was in an aquarium and you know, you see like, the polar bear come by or the big shark and it's all playing out in front of you and you can't touch it. It's just like a movie, you know? I felt kind of the yeah. joy of the people who were stopped in their cars. Um, many of them obviously working people who were going off to their jobs who were like having, you know, early Christmas. It was a highway to money heaven. Route 3 West, right in front of MetLife Stadium. People were stopping short, pulling over, even jumping over dividers just to catch some green. Betsy Richards watched it from the window of her bus. And there were $100 bills, $5 bills. People seem to be very interested in, you know, whose money this was. Again, this is not free money. If Whether were people were taking the money or giving the money back. The money technically belongs to Brinks, police officers say, and it's illegal for drivers to keep it. In Miami, the cop heads to the scene. Money was actually spilling down off the expressway, down into the neighborhood, and people were actually out grabbing it up. This was the very same expressway that had, had destroyed the community. We were severely outnumbered, and we saw people starting to run off in different directions with fistfuls and pocketsfuls running from the police because they were, they were afraid that they'd have to return the money or they were gonna be arrested. It was kind of funny. I mean, you know, just to see people running from all over the place had a sort of comical ring to it. The cop hits the streets of Overtown looking for information about the missing money. As we were going around door to door asking people to give the money back to turn it in, we also knew that in those homes, people were struggling with the dilemma of, now I've got a way to make ends meet. Yeah, I, I uh, lived in Overtown as a kid. As a matter of fact, most of my high school years were in Overtown. I knew these people. And so when they're telling me something that's not true, I know they're telling me something that's not true. You see the looks on faces. You see that, that, that smirk. You see these things that are telltale signs that what they're about to tell you is not going to be the truth, and they know that you know it's not. Most of the residents we talked to said the money that fell from this bridge was good for the neighborhood. Half a million dollars, so plus 300000 in food stamps, vanishes in Overtown. If somebody did find money, do you actually think they're going to return it? That money is going to good use. In Atlanta... 
The vet surveys the scene. Should I stop? Should I not stop? You know, yeah, of course I'm gonna stop. It looks fun. I mean, it's money on the side of the road. Why not? Picked up some ones. I think I picked up a five. I stuffed money into my pockets, and I, I didn't have any organization to it. I just kind of picked it up, threw it in my pocket, and just kept on going. My first instinct was that people were going to be fighting each other, and um, someone might pull a weapon. Someone might, you know, hit someone, start a fight, start a mob, something of the sort. Me and this this other gentleman, I. I mean, we're almost going side by side, picking up the same, <laughs> our separate lines, and then there's one at the end. It's a five. And we kind of both paused and kind of looked at each other like, who's going to grab it first? And then uh, it's like, go, go ahead, go ahead. You, you can get that. You can get that. And I'm like, oh, well, thank you. I remember one person kind of walked down the hill about 20 feet toward me. They shout over and said, the higher bills are up there. That's where the big pile is. The higher bills are up there. Some people were on the phone saying, oh, you need to get out here. This is what's going on. This is amazing. I didn't know if anyone called the police. I figured someone had. Check on 911. We'll see you at the emergency. Look, on 285 West, there's money all over the road. There's people stopping if they can get up. Oh. There's money everywhere. People are just grabbing it. And people are starting to get happy to pull over to get it. I don't know what denomination the bills are. It's money. It's, it's paper money. Money all over the Southway, believe it or not. I mean, people are out of their cars yeah. running back and forth across five lanes of traffic. Oh, my goodness. I remember at one point a woman walking out to the third lane, almost to the fourth lane, to pick up money. This is just getting insane. This is a lot of people. This is still a highway. I, I didn't really want to see someone get hit by a car. I didn't want to see a car wreck or get hit. I I don't want to be around this if it goes bad. That's why I decided to kind of get back in the car. You know, I, I'm just going to take what I have and leave. In total, $175,000 was spilled in Atlanta. Wow, that was a lot of money. 175000 After the vet takes off, police officers show up. They record on their body cams, and they clean up what's left of the cash on I-285, catching bills as they drift past on the breeze. I was walking, and $50 flew up. Flew up out of nowhere, I came to Really? Yeah, $50 bill. <laughs> hey, man, don't, don't, yeah. <laughs> Back behind the wheel of his Toyota RAV4, the vet speeds away from the scene with the money. Probably about 30 seconds down the road, I called the parents. You will not believe what just happened. <laughs> and once I got back to my parents' apartment, I kind of sat in my car for a minute and found everything in my pockets and started you know, counting it and went, wow. I folded it up in half and then uh, put it in my wallet separately, then the two or three dollars I had in my wallet initially, and I just kept it separate. Uh, I believe it was the next day, the Fulton County Police Department kind of put in their social media that, you know, it's it's not your money. It needs to be returned if you have it. I remember almost verbatim, it was anything under a thousand dollars is a misdemeanor. Anything over is a felony. I mean, I really just talked to my parents about it, kind of, why should I keep this? Why should I give this back sort of thing? And the Air Force has three core values. It's uh, integrity first, search for self, and excellence in all we do. And it really tested my integrity. I think it was five or six o'clock at night, and I made the decision of I'm going to take it back because that was not my money. My dad chose to come with me, so we rode there, and it was kind of just one of those you know, what do you think they're going to do? What do you think they're going to ask me? I don't know if he's going to, you know, take me in custody for a little bit as we fill out paperwork. In that situation, your mind kind of jumps a little bit. Navis. In just a moment, the vet finds out that he is not the only one with a guilty conscience. 
when the Money Truck episode continues. Stay tuned. In my house, we don't agree on anything food-wise, except this, Dave's Killer Bread. Why? Because it's awesome. Just look at a loaf. Take a slice. It's made of real stuff, delicious stuff, tasty stuff. Look, see, no wonder it's America's number one organic bread. Visit daveskillerbread.com to learn more and look for Dave's Killer Bread in the bread aisle of your local grocery store. Dave's Killer Bread. Bread Amplified. Support for Snap Judgment comes from Odoo. What is Odoo? Well, Odoo is an all-in-one management software with apps for every business need. Odoo has apps for CRM, accounting, sales, HR, inventory, manufacturing, and everything in between. And they're all in one easy-to-use software. And the best part about Odoo? All Odoo apps are integrated, helping you get things done faster and more efficiently. So when you think about business, think Odoo. To learn more, visit odoo.com slash snap. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash snap. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the money truck episode. When last we left, the vet was on his way to the police station, ready to return the cash he picked up from Interstate 285. Snap Judgment. When the vet and his dad get to the police station, the police officer comes out of the evidence room and greets them. He's recording on his body cam. He's like, you returning money to you? Yes, sir, I am. He apparently had just got done with someone else and he wasn't upset. At one point he asked me, well, how much are you returning? I think it was 13 ones and a five. $18. He kind of just blinked at me for a second, like $18. All right, so Philip, here's the case number. Uh, they're saying that I collected $18 from you. If you flip it over, that's all of my information. The vet is one of nine uh, people who turns in money from what becomes known in Atlanta as the Perimeter Payday. One person turns in $2,094. Another turns in $520. Another returns 24 bucks. $18 is the least that was turned in, so that was myself. My dad kind of joked about it. He's like, you know, all this money that fell on the ground, he picked up $18, and like that's all it was, was $18. I mean, if I found $40,000 in the ground might have been a different conversation. I kind of, you know, kicked myself in the back a little bit on that one and kind of thought about it more. I'm like, why did I not stay longer and why did I not keep it? That night for me, for Uber, was not as good. I think it was only like $20 with Uber Eats that night. And then I picked up $18, so I almost doubled what I did. <laughs> on the way home, I think I passed the gas station and went, Man, it'd be nice to fill up my tank real quick with $18, but um, I, I decide not to. On I-95 outside New York, the armored car guy looks over at his partner. He's freaking out. He's like, Stokes, we're going to lose our job. We're done. We're done. So I had to smack him, get him back in control and focus. I said, listen, go up there, grab the money, okay? Calm down. I'll stay with the truck. We both can't leave the truck. If we leave the truck, somebody could take the whole truck. He said, there's people everywhere. I said, you have a firearm, put it in the air and fire. It works in New York like that. They disperse, trust me, it will work. It was mayhem. It was like people running, literally almost getting hit by other cars just to grab some money. It was crazy. Track the trailer stopping, everybody stopping. I mean, and then after they picked up the money, they rolled by and saying thank you to me. Thank you, sir. Thank you, armor car guys. Thank you. No, everybody was thanking me that went by. Thank you. They was blowing a horn, thumbs up. People had banners out their cars. Thank you. God bless you. I just had to laugh about it. I mean, what else am I going to do? The money's insured. That's why it's called insurance. 
I just, how you say, I just enjoyed the moment. It was so crazy because Connie Chung called me out of nowhere. I don't know how she got my cell number. Don't ask me. I don't know how. And I picked up the phone. I said, hello. She said, hi, this is Connie Chung from Channel 7 News. I'm like, are you for real? Who am I speaking to? I said, you're speaking to an armored car guy, Stokes. Why? She's like, are you the one with the money that fell out the back of the truck? I said, yeah, you're talking to him. And she was like, we'll be right there. Don't go nowhere. I said, are you serious? Before she said right there, somebody was setting up a, 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 a tripod up. They're ready to like start filming right then and there. And then my CEO guy, Rodriguez, calls us and said, get in the truck now and get out of there. Get out of there. In Oregon, the lady with the horse pasture is told by the guard standing next to the truck that crashed into her field that she isn't allowed to take any pictures. I'd never had a, a guard standing there with a rifle slung over his shoulder and acting like it was, you know, some sort of top secret thing. I kind of thought that was a little overblown, the top secret thing. So I went up to the corral and I took pictures. <laughs> you know, it's my property. It's my damn property and I'll do what I want. <laughs> That's what I thought, you know. <laughs> He's invading my property. I am not invading his property. And of course, uh, immediately there was people, spectators and newsmen and stuff like that. They called in a crew that stayed here until dark or dusk, gleaning the field and picking up all the money. And then when they left, they said, anything you find out here is yours. The next day, her friend comes by with the metal detector. They don't find much. I mean, minimal amount of money. It was pennies and nickels and dimes. You know, I mean, they got all the quarters, I think. In the middle of nowhere, Iowa, Cash keeps falling from the sky. The lucky guy sits in his car. I was more confused than anything else. When I first tried to open my door, somebody was running by and hit it and kind of closed it back on me. That's how many people were out running around. So it was kind of like a herd mentality panic. Everybody around us was picking up whatever they could and throwing it in their cars. I just ended up taking a couple handfuls that were on the windshield and throwing them into the car. The lucky guy gathers the bills and stuffs them into a flexible lunchbox cooler. He heads down the highway, the cash in his back seat. At best, maybe there was several thousand dollars. I don't know, but it wasn't enough to excite me. It wasn't enough to, to you know, oh, I'm set for life. We were going to continue to the next town and just turn it in. We were stopped before we got there. There's a police checkpoint. Two officers step out of a squad car. They asked if we'd driven through it, and we said yes. And they asked if we picked something up, and we said yes. And then they asked, can you guys follow us to fill out paperwork? And we said, okay. And then it was getting to the police station that they informed us that we were being detained. Detained. The lucky guy is charged with theft. That much money on the side of the road, there's going to be somebody looking for it. Um, I was concerned I was going to miss my upcoming work. Uh, I was concerned that this was going to take a financial bite out of my ass. I was shocked. He's led through the police station, past cops sifting through piles of money. Tables and tables full of cash spread out. They took whatever we had, and they were all like, you know, $20 bills. I never got an official count, honestly. I do know that the person that was arrested after me, he had, I, I think, like over 20 grand on him. After getting his mug shot, the lucky guy is shut inside a closet full of bookshelves and discarded furniture. That's how small of a town it was. You know, if I was like the A-team, I probably could have built something to get out of there. <laughs> I had really done nothing wrong other than picked up something I found on the ground in the middle of the highway. That night he makes bail and calls a lawyer who gets his charges reduced to a misdemeanor. When I walked out of the booking facility, I got back in my car and I continued down the road for at least 100 miles or so. I might have left the state that night. I was like, what the fuck was that about? Like, seriously, what the hell was that about? The armored car guy is taken to the state police barracks. It's one o'clock in the morning. I was there for about three hours. 
interrogating me to find out what led up to the money falling out the back of the truck. Just write down everything, what happened, you know, throughout the whole day to lead up to this. And that was it, and then they let us go. Actually, I thought that all of this was gonna be a big misunderstanding, it was a freak accident, and then I just go back to work like regular. That's the thing I'm thinking in my mind, the truck probably was bad or whatever like that. I would never know it fell out if the lady never pulled me over. I'd have got all the way back to Trenton and never knew nothing about it. If a door ajars, ajar me when it opens, uh, when it opens, the alarm goes off and it's a red light in the front of the driver's side. It's a big bright red light that just ain't, ain't like that to let you know a door open. That didn't work. No light, no alarm, no nothing. The armored car guy doesn't go back to work the next day or the day after that. They suspended me and the other guy for like a few days until they said they got to sort it out. So when a few days came, the manager called me. He said, Stokes, you got to come in, bring your badge, your firearm. They letting you go. I said, let me go for what? I didn't do nothing wrong. It could have happened to anybody. What happened was it was a state trooper in an unmarked car when the bag fell out the back of the truck. He saw the bag fell out the back of the truck and a car ran over the bag. And that's when he started writing everybody plate number down. Yeah, 80,000 was in the bag and all recovered except for $46. So long story short, I lost my job for $46. So when I got there to return my stuff, my badge, I felt like a police over there that's just lost his job for no reason. My partner, I looked at him and I felt bad and I even tried to stick up for him. I said, listen, let him at least keep his job because I asked him to come with me. He was going home that day. He said, Stokes, it doesn't work like that. He was with you, you both is fine. At the armored car places, I was flagged. Everywhere they had an article with me, with my pitch on the wall, don't hire this guy. It messed my credit up. I couldn't get nothing. I lost my house in Trenton. I had a nice three bedroom house, fenced in yard, everything. I was depressed. I was there for five years. I wanted to retire with them. I wanted to get the gold watch with the armored truck in it. You know, a nice plaque. Of, of show my, you know, appreciation that I was there for 20 years. The armored car guy still remembers the most money he ever hauled. The most money was a hundred million and they had to burn it. You throw all the money in this like oven thing and it just burn up millions and millions and millions of dollars. That's not circulating no more. You gotta remember, United States makes the money. We make money every day. We print money every day. We burn money every day. When you're sitting at home trying to figure out how you're going to pay a bill, you just have this fantasy that you're going to win the lottery or that somehow the Brinks truck is going to open and money is going to fly through the air and you're going to scoop some up. And it just fulfilled all of that longing. Having enough money is not just working hard. It's also luck. If I was on the other shoe and I was driving on the turnpike and, and I seen an armored car drop money out the back of the truck. If you find a wallet in the ground and it has a thousand dollars in it. If I'm out there in the middle of my hay field and I find a sack of money that actually fell from the sky from an airplane. Do you take the money or do you find the owner? Is that morally wrong if there's nobody around? Come on, stop it. This is reality. What's the right thing to do? Take care of my family or return this money? I might have a moral dilemma there. A few years later, the lady with the horse pasture witnesses a second armored truck crash in her field. It just shouldn't have happened. I mean, one was enough. I didn't need two. And I was really, really upset by this time. I mean, I was ranting and raving and pointing and gesturing and there's no damn excuse for this. And if anybody would just drive decently, it wouldn't happen. And I'm really tired of this happening. And
very, very big thank you to everyone who spoke to us for this story. Troy Stokes, Philip Dean, Betsy Richards, Delrish Moss, Carol Steele, and The Lucky Guy. Featuring Shannon Kaysen as a narrator. Check out Shannon's podcast, Homemade Stories, to hear more from the Shannon. And big thanks to Tyler Easter, who first reported Philip Dean's story for the Atlanta Journal-Constitution. And thanks as well to Cole Richards and Randy Scott Carroll for the recording assistance. The original score for this story was by Renzo Gorio. It's produced by Anna Sussman, John Fasile, and Nancy Lopez. Now don't go anywhere, snappers, because after the break, we're looking for a miracle. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Snap Judgment, the money truck episode. My name is Glenn Washington, and our next story starts back in the days of Prohibition, the time of bootleg whiskey, secret nightclubs, and lots and lots of police raids. Snap Judgment. The Jungle Room was, it it only seated like 300 people. It had all kinds of masks from all over Africa and African fabric on the walls. And and the the, uh, tables, they looked like huge African drums. What they were most famous for is that like Cab Calloway and uh, Count Basie and Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald would come to the club after working hours. So after they finished playing at the Cotton Club at 2 o'clock in the morning, they would come to the Jungle Room and they would perform for each other. When the cops came, because they, they came fairly regularly, there was, there was this really sophisticated system of shutdown and flip over. And when you hit the switch, maybe 20 of these liquor cabinets flip around to the opposite side and they present a blank wall. The craps table flipped over, gambling tables disappear. By the time the police actually got inside, there would be nothing that they considered illegal going on. As an African in America, you have to always be on your guard. You have to always be aware. You have to always know what's going on. My grandfather recognized the fact that he was a goose in a fox court. Well, basically what's happening is they tell the story of old sister goose who was walking down the way. She gets snatched up by a fox. The fox wants to break her neck and eat her. And she says, no, hold on. You can't do that. We're going to go to the police. They call the police, but the police, they were foxes also. So she said, well, we're going to the courthouse. And they went to the courthouse. And at the courthouse, the, the, the judge was a fox and the jury were foxes. So they broke her neck and they picked her bones. You cannot get goose justice in a fox court. And from that, I recognized that it was necessary for me to leave the United States of America and get out of Dodge. When I was 21 years old, I was on the island of St. Thomas. And the reason that I was on the island of St. Thomas is because when I studied what is the closest place where people speak English, that's what came up. And it cost no more than $25 for me to get there. And I got there. And when I got there, everybody looked like me. I got a college degree. I'm like, I'm going to have a job. I finally got that first real job, the first real job that I ever wanted to have that would get me on the path to what I wanted to do. Here I am. I am an elementary school teacher in the Virgin Islands. Get out of here. I'd just become a school teacher. That was my first week, uh, slightly inebriated. Me and my five white friends, everybody was a school teacher. Males, testosterone 
zooming all over the place. I mean, you know, none of us were punks. And so we're walking down this alley and somebody says, oh, look, they left the door open to the big time restaurant. And they said, oh, look, the back door is open. So somebody said, man, you know, somebody could go in there and just steal all of that food. And somebody said, oh, no, they couldn't do that because there's like this screen door there. And I said, actually, I could flip the latch on that door um, real easily. And we could just go in and take anything we wanted. We took all of the hamburger meat, we took all of the cheese, and we took all of the steaks. And and we weren't really even thinking about what we were doing. We just took, we didn't take anything else. We took the steaks and we took the hamburger. We knew we could eat steaks and hamburgers, you know, share steaks and hamburgers with all our friends on the beach, you know. I mean, if we were in Hawaii, we would have called it a luau. Actually, I shouldn't admit this, but at the time, it seemed like a good idea. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, the police jumped out and shouted, put up your hands, put your hands up. Being from Harlem, I immediately tried to touch the sky. They took us to the police station and I was immediately separated from my friends. Did I mention the fact that uh, my friends were white uh, and I'm not? So I'm in this interrogation room and I'm sitting there and I'm just waiting because I don't know what's going on. So they put me in the cell. These cells are 18th century dungeons with high ceilings and just one ventilation shaft It's real dismal kind of conditions in there. All my friends bailed out the next day. I was suspended from my job as a school teacher. It took five weeks before we had a trial. During that five weeks, my co-defendants never contacted me. When we arrived at court, They all had Brooks Brothers lawyers. You know, they were suited and booted, and nobody spoke to me. I was the only person who had a court-appointed attorney, and he was late. He was five minutes late. He was 10 minutes late. Okay, I'm sweating bullets. I mean, you know, I'm going to jail. My lawyer was nearly 20 minutes late. Then he burst through the doors with a flourish. He was mid-60s in age, a handsome brown-skinned man with a swagger. He looks like something out of Ebony magazine. He looks like a fashion model. I mean, he's clean as the board of hell. And when he walks through the door, the judge says to him, Good morning, Judge Christian. My lawyer is a retired judge. I'm like, man, all right. And then my, my, my lawyer says to the judge, begging your honor's pardon, the reason why I was late is because I was in the hallway speaking with the arresting officers and they want to dismiss all the charges against my client without prejudice. They're dismissing all the charges against me without prejudice. Now... My five friends, they still there. They still got court to go to, and I'm leaving. I'm out. I'm free to go. I'm out of there. I figured it out really quickly. It felt like, I guess it must feel like what it feels like being a Caucasian in America. I found out later on that they were ordered to pay heavy fines. They were exiled from the island and told if they ever returned, they would be charged and imprisoned. But that's not even the end of the story. See, once I got outside of the courtroom, my lawyer, he says to me, have you been paid for the time that you were suspended from teaching? 
And I said, no. He said, you were suspended for five weeks? I said, yeah, I've not been paid. He said, okay, I want you to go to the governor's office. Tell him that I said that they must pay you. So I went to the governor's office. When I get to the governor's mansion, everybody knows who I am. I don't know how everybody, everybody knew who I was when I walked up, big old afro, three-piece suit, watch out. And I go into the governor's office, and he's like, have a seat. Have a seat? You want me to, you know, like, sit down? All right. So I sit down in the governor's office, and I'm actually feeling a little bit relaxed, you know. So we start talking. He asked me where I'm from. I saw I'm from New York. You know, I grew up in Harlem. He said, oh, Harlem. I remember Harlem. I remember Harlem back during the Roaring Twenties. I used to hang out in Harlem back in the day. And I was like, really? You know, because my grandfather, he hung out in Harlem too, you know, and he owned a, a club, you know, called the Jungle Room. He said, Mr. B? You talking Mr. B? You Mr. B grandson? Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord, this is Mr. B. Grandson in here. You know, we start talking and, and kicking it a little bit, and he says, I got to give him my grandfather's address and telephone number, and they haven't gotten together in all these years. Oh, yeah, and here, let me sign this petition for you. You know, and I need you, anytime you have a problem or anything, you come back by, I want you to know that my door is always open to you. Your door is always open to me, and you are the governor. And the governor saying to me, if there's anything that you need, if there's anything that I need, he said, if there's anything that you need, just give me a call. Dude, we were going to get some goose justice up in the goose court. You know what I'm saying? Watch out. Thanks, as always, to the great Abdul Kenyatta for that story. The original score was by Leon Morimoto. That piece was produced by Anna Sussman. Snappers, we had an extra drop in our podcast feed this week. It's an incredible and important story, only available on our podcast, On Our Watch. It's an investigative podcast series from our friends at KQED. And this season, it follows the stories of two correctional officers who pay a high price for exposing corruption by their fellow officers. In California's most dangerous prison, New Folsom. Check out the Snap Judgment podcast feed to listen. I know. I know, it happened again. But if you missed even a moment of today's show, subscribe to the Snap Judgment Podcast. Subscribe because someone's story might just change your life. For real, it's changed mine. Get into the Snap Nation conversation on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Do not miss a beat. And if you want to let the world know you snap, just hit the Snap Studio shop. Get yourself that T-shirt. You're probably sitting next to someone right now who loves the show. Celebrate! Snapjudgment.org. That is brought to you by the team that knows exactly what they do if money fell from the sky. Everyone knows. Except for the Uber producer, Mr. Mark Ristich. He'd probably spend all his on fruit cups. There's Pat McCity Miller, Anna Sussman, Renzo Gorio, John Facile, Shayna Sheely, Marissa Dodge, Nick Asain, Tail Ducat, Leon Morimoto, Flo Wiley, Nancy Lopez and Regina Bariato. And this is not the news. No way is this the news. In fact, you could walk into the police station, tell them all about the bad thing you just did, and have them laugh at you and call you names. And you would still, still, not be as far away from the news as this is. But this is P.
P R X.